Hello and welcome to the Vision Podcast 3.0. My name is Julia Brunton and some people call me Jules. This podcast is about life, whether your goal is living your best life or simply navigating life. By listening to this podcast, you may learn something new, you may well get inspired and you may well laugh. And you may even find you ignite a new sense of self-belief too. All I ask is you remain open. Each week, please join me and guests as we share stories, learnings and truths from past and present, the good, the bad, the brilliant. Thank you for joining the Vision community. Before we go into discussions, conversation, for those that don't know who you are, Paul is, I call him rugby man in my mind. You're, you're sym- synonymous with the game. Now, I hopefully correct me if I've got this, if I've got this wrong. It's just a quick recap. But senior career, we've got Leicester Tigers, London Irish Saracens. We've got national team under 21 England. Yes. Yeah. And did we have Barbarians? Is that right or not? Yeah, I, pl- I played for, I played for every England team from. Right. Under 19s to the senior team that, but I, I played two England games, uh, but they didn't, you didn't get a cap in those games for the games oh. I played originally. And I played the Barbarians. So I kind of did almost everything without ever quite, you know, breaking through to the very top. I was in a few England camps and that kind of stuff, but never got a full yeah. cap. And then, and then you shifted into the coaching where you uh, coach with Saracens, England, Harlequins, Benetton in Italy, and now you're currently at. Stade Francais. Is that how you say, is that the right pronunciation or? Well, it's close. I think they say Stade Francais, yeah. But well, it's, I was about to say Stade. It's, it's one of yeah. those things, is it? Have I, I've already balls it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think okay. it's Stade Francais. Stade's just like a, um, there's, there's lots of teams actually Stade something, Stade something in France, but yeah. Stade yeah. Francais three. Now, now, what I would normally do in these sort of conversations, I tend to, uh, you know, start off with a few openers and then towards the end, I throw in a quick fire round. But I thought we would reverse it and start okay. off with a quick fire round for, as a bit of a warm up. Which, so first of all, earliest athletic memory. OK, so I'd have been about seven years old, eight years old. And I think I just watched Zola Bud run uh, oh. barefoot barefoot in the 1984 Olympics and I remember running at school and everyone was going out there with their new trainers and I took my socks and shoes off and I ran barefoot to win the 100 meter race fantastic good (laughs) memory texting or calling probably texting nowadays which goes against probably most things that I like in life but with meetings and people being busy I I find it's a way without disturbing people a way to to leave some more thought uh, and then come back to the call later on Nice. Showers or baths? Shower. Okay. Best quality? Uh, my hands. Uh, no, I'd say, uh, <laughs> I think, I think maybe, <laughs> look, I, th- I think my best quality is I care. I think I, I, I care. I, so w- whatever it is that I invest time into, yeah. it be friendship, uh, relationships, family, my job, mm. and people. Um, I care for, for the human before, before the profession. Yeah. Well, you really care because some people talk about it, but you actually action it. Absolutely. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? God, no. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> say, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. S- say a word in French. Uh, a word in French. Bonjour. Okay. Uh, late night or early morning? Uh, I'm uh, I'm early morning at four. Normally up around quarter past four, half past four, and I leave the house at five to go to the gym. And the consequence of that, obviously, is I go early to bed because I need some sleep. So I'm normally in bed around 10 o'clock, half 10, maybe the latest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm always awake around four, half four. Who do you most admire? Maybe. Okay, so t- two answers maybe then. I go uh, my wife uh, because mm-hmm. we've got three kids. And when I'm not at work and I see in the holiday time how hard it is to, to parent, uh, I, thank, I, I, thank, I thank the uh, heavens above that she's around. And then... The other thing, probably, it's not it's not necessarily somebody. There's lots of sports people I admire, but I I rather admire people that make a difference to someone else in their life. So mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter what it is. We, we we saw lots of things, obviously, with COVID, yeah, and, and how people made a difference, and everyone kind of warmed to that. But but anyone that can make a difference to somebody else makes their life a little bit better or their moment a little bit better. I I admire that quality in people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I like that. Any pets? No, we did have a dog for a while, but unfortunately, he was sick, so he had to go back. Okay, sweet or savoury? Savoury. 
Okay. How long does it take you to get ready at night? Yeah, I'd say about five minutes to get dressed, about 30 minutes for my hair. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'm, I'm quick. Eh? I'm, I'm five minutes. The only thing I get into a ritual all the time before I go out, whether or not I showered earlier in the day or anything, I always get showered again before I go out. Even for just two minutes, I just like mm -hmm. the feeling of feeling fresh, making an effort as best I can. And then, yeah, to throw on, I mean, for a man, it's, it's often easy. We just throw on some jeans and a T-shirt and mm -hmm. voila. Voila, exactly. Favourite city in the world? Oh, wow. Can I say three? Yes. <laughs> okay. New York. Mm -hmm. uh, London. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying Paris, but but I absolutely love Melbourne. I absolutely love Melbourne, Australia. Okay. Okay. Melbourne. That's it. There's a, there's a, the cricket ground there. And um, the name of the avenue round the cricket ground is my last name. So there's a picture of me. Oh, wow. So yes. so where, where the where the MCG is, um, next yeah. to that, there's there's obviously like four or five AFL teams around there. Yeah. There's Amy Stadium, which is where the rugby league team play, the Melbourne Storm, and the Melbourne Rebels play, which was a, a rugby union team. And I coached over there for a while as well. Oh, okay. um, but I really enjoyed the vibe of the city, uh, obviously yeah. the water as well. But there's a real... I like I like the energy of Australian people, and I like mm -hmm. I like the feeling of the city that it's it's geared around sport and uh, mm -hmm. creativity and art, and I think it's a really cool place to live. Absolutely, favorite junk food, if you partake, uh, maybe you don't. Uh, <laughs> um, I would probably say it's a toss up between salted peanuts <laughs> and and any variety of crisps, probably. Godfather or Star Wars? Oh wow. Mm -hmm. That is too tough to answer, eh? Okay. Uh, I go, I go Star Wars probably just because of more memories associated with the film and the franchise. Okay. Are women complicated? Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Sorry, this, this wasn't architect. I literally pulled these questions from this. Right, okay. there's, there's places you can grab them, and it made me chuckle when I read it. But okay. if you don't, if you don't feel compelled to answer it, we can. No, no, no. Of course, I think it's always worth answering. You don't walk away. I would say. Yes, they are complicated, but it's worth trying to understand them. Nicely put, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> would you climb a mountain or jump out of a plane? Uh, I would climb a mountain because um, I, I like the idea of the physical challenge. Mm. Obviously, there's a bravery and courage thing with jumping out of a plane, but the effort to climb a mountain, the preparation you require to do that, I think is more significant. So I think I think I'd rather take on that challenge. Absolutely. Well, that that wraps up that quick fire section. Well done. But I thought I thought that was a nice, you know, gentle walk in. Yeah, no, but, no, um, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Going back now, full circle. Yeah, quite full circle to the beginning and rugby. Now, if I had it right, you you have some rugby in the family, so to speak. Was that like key instigator for you joining? Uh, were you a general, a good, great sportsman across the board, or and how uh, did you dial into rugby? Yeah, I suppose in my mind I was a great sports person, obviously, but uh, maybe in <laughs> in actual fact, maybe not so much. But I, I played all sports. Like I, I grew up in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, Newcastle for yeah. I know there's two Newcastles in England. So, but uh, I grew up in Newcastle, and you know it's football mad. It's a football city. Um, mm. However, my dad was a uh, was a rugby player. He didn't play football. He had two left feet. Um, so it wasn't something, he, but he enjoyed contact, enjoyed uh, the mm. physical nature that rugby gave. Even for him, he grew up in Newcastle. It didn't happen rugby for him till he was late, maybe mm. 19, 20. He happened to be quite good at it because he enjoyed the contact. So when I was a kid, um, I got exposed to all sports. At school was always football, of course. And then we started going to a, a junior rugby club in the morning on a Sunday. Uh, I changed school, I had a rugby element as well, and then kind of rugby took off for me. But I kind of always played rugby, cricket. I, I tried everything. I tried everything I possibly could. Um, I think definitely we, we now know um, in sports that diversification um, is, is critical for you know motor neuron skills and uh, and also for mm -hmm. for developing actually uh, specifics in a sport. If you if you specialize too early, perhaps you, you lose out in other contexts of things and mm -hmm. stuff. So I think I think getting a, an exposure to as many different things as possible. Uh, in terms of sporting context, is uh, is vital. I definitely did that. I think that's really good, but it also would. I think it translates into life as a whole, doesn't it? To have that, if you if you niche too early, you're not getting insights and learnings that you can pull and uh, pull and apply. I guess. But, yeah, look, um, 
They, they spoke a lot, didn't they, about like 10,000 hours of practice, right, to, to yeah. perfect a skill. And there's definitely, you know, if you dedicate time to something, you can improve. And there's plenty of people mm-hmm. that have had um, big success by devoting time, time, time into something. And, and you know, as you get towards, the, you know, higher echelons of sport or business and, or, or whatever it may be, you, you have yeah. to dedicate more time to something specific to excel. However, I think that the more you um, have an awareness uh, and an appreciation mm-hmm. of feel for different things, be it sport, be it, be it work, be it art, be it literature or something, yeah. is the more you can, one, understand what you like, mm-hmm. two, what you can really have a passion for. And I, I, I felt, for me, I was never forced into something. My dad would have loved me to play rugby, um, of course, and um, but but it was never that I had to play rugby. At times, when I was 11 or 12, I kind of fell out of love with rugby for a while. Mm-hmm. And it was really, I was into cricket. I was playing county cricket in, in Northumberland. And I kind of thought, oh, this is for me. And then, you know, uh, six months later, I changed my mind again and did a bit more rugby and, you know, still playing football with my friends and that kind of stuff. Volleyball, did, just tried anything, really. Um, I just struggled with racket sports for one reason or another. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't, couldn't quite get a hold of it. But, but I enjoy trying, you know. And I think if you can try, rather try and fail, then, then, then never give yourself a chance. Absolutely, absolutely. So when when you were, you obviously went into rugby, that, but... Specifically, I want to look at that transition from player to coach. How did that come about? Can you sort of open up a little bit about that? Or was that a conscious decision where you thought, right, okay, I do love this sport and I want to remain in it, and but in a different sort of capacity? Look, I think, I think if, if I go back a little bit, is, is when I became a professional rugby player, I was at university. Mm-hmm. And the game initially was not professional sport. So it only became professional in 96, 95, 96. Yeah, right. I remember being away on an um, England Colts tour or, or 21s tour. I might misremember the timing slightly, but the game turned professional whilst whilst I was away. And I remember going back and I was playing at what is now Newcastle, 18, 19, maybe. So I think maybe it was mm-hmm. 95. And I went to play men's rugby instead because I didn't feel I could physically um, compete against men at 18 years old. So I went to a different club and I was then 12 years in or 13 years into professional career. So I was one of the first few that really started at the beginning mm-hmm. in their career as a professional athlete. So there's groups of players, obviously, that were older than me that had the back end of their careers professional. But I did pretty much start to finish in, a, in an elite men's game as mm-hmm. a professional. So I did law at university, go through my mm-hmm. rugby career. And I actually didn't really have a desire to be a professional coach. I wanted to coach maybe kids, uh, give back to the game a little bit. And I was looking at different things in the city around um, investments uh, in in the FX sector. I was looking Mm. at insurance. Um, I I wasn't necessarily going to law, but it was a universal degree that helped me show aptitude and, and desire to learn. So I was kind of looking to do something there. Then as my career was ending, uh, Eddie Jones, who was the England, uh, England coach up to recently, um, he was the incoming coach at uh, Saracens, which was my last playing club. And he said, look, I think uh, you make a good coach. Um, you know, we, we might try and keep you on as a player. I was 32 at the time, I think, or 33. He says, but I think you make a good coach and I've got a role for a skills coach. I'd like you, I'd like you to do it. So at the time I was engaged to somebody, uh, no longer with them, but I was engaged mm-hmm. to somebody. Time. and we were getting married and we kind of said look we want to stay in London and although I had opportunity to play elsewhere the one at Saracens was a 50-50 kind of call so we kind of made the decision look let's just back this coaching route we'll give it a go I did an assignment for Eddie really enjoyed the idea around it but I was almost like an accidental coach because I didn't really it wasn't something that my mind was focused on what I think you find is whenever you've been used to something for a period of time for 12 years or 13 years, my entire education in a profession was rugby. So there's a there's a nervousness. Um, you can be scared when you finish something about what next, what next. So it was almost a little bit safety as well. And, you know, I didn't have to move house. I was I was mm-hmm. still involved in sport. It's a lifestyle job at times. Although mm-hmm. Stress, obviously, but there's a lifestyle job at times. And that was it. And then my journey started. And, and I kind of always say with, with Eddie, he either recruited me as a coach or he retired me as a player. Mm. And, you know, and Eddie, um, it's probably better both, but probably more retiring me as a player. But that was that was the start of it. And I kind of fell in love with, you know, helping people, uh, seeing a difference, um, seeing, seeing people's faces when they achieve their dream and have their moment in the sun. So, 
Yeah, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to start off with. Um, we got lucky a little bit, Saracens. We really, really hit a winning streak quite early on in my career. And off the back of it, a lot of good things have happened. Fantastic. Thank you. It's in, yeah, it's interesting and helpful to hear that whole, because it's real life. You you know, you were navigating all those different aspects which do present, you know, when you're going through transitions and making decisions because it is balancing up all the different sort of compartments, so to speak. So it's... um which there can be often more than one. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, now something I've, I've seen you on camera. Um, you're very versed on camera, and uh, I've seen plenty of YouTube and uh, microphones and all this. So it made me think, have you or did you have training at all? Or is it, <laughs> was it just a muscle that you grew over time? That was just a, out of interest from um, my perspective. Yeah, look, I, I, th- I think it's a bit of both. I always had, you know, I, I captained quite a lot of teams, I think obviously mm-hmm. doing the degree I did at university, you got used to debate, uh, standing mm-hmm. up in front of people. And I kind of enjoyed the buzz of, of or the nerves of presenting at times. So I kind of enjoyed that feeling before where you feel vulnerable mm-hmm. uh, and you know, you're ready to expose yourself uh, and, and speak about something that you have some knowledge on. So mm-hmm. I kind of always enjoyed that kind of feeling of presenting um, as a player or, or when I was at university. Um, even at school, even at school as a school captain. So I, I kind of, I kind of always had that in me. But of course, what we now understand is when you're a rugby player and speaking with your peers is one thing. But when everyone's looking at you and you're the the head of the circle or you're the head of a room and you're trying to get forty five minds uh, narrowed into one mm. one singular thought, then it's not just the ability to orate. There, there's tactics and, and techniques that you can use that obviously help you deliver. Um, over over the last twenty years or so, I, I think I've I've seen different mentors, different coaches to upscale. Obviously, uh, literature and reading can obviously also help, and you know the impact of TED probably as well. I think give people like a different way to look at how to present. And uh, I enjoy watching lots of things on there, and you just try and pick up things as you can and find something that works for you. You know, I, I don't deviate too much from a from probably a marketing mantra of tell them what you're going to tell them. Right. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And I probably don't <laughs> move too far away from that. And obviously, it's not always just me telling us questioning and mini groups and breakout groups and stuff. But I kind of keep that as a formula. Like any good story, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. As much as possible, I, I lay that in with a story or an, 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 uh, an analogy or a metaphor or a life experience or something that's current that I can make mm-hmm. tangible to a, to a current moment. And yeah, I, I kind of, I, I really enjoy that aspect of presenting because what we do know is our mind works best with pictures. And, you know, if I was to ask you what your best day of your life is, you you don't think of the date so much. You think of the moment and you see yourself standing there or who you were with or what you were listening to or what you were eating, what you were drinking. And I kind of feel as much as I can paint a picture mm-hmm. for people and they can really draw uh, more powerful imagery, which will help them elicit the response that we want. So as much as possible, I go stories. As much as possible, I go uh, history. So, you know, recall, uh, perception and reality. Try and bring them through those three moments through through different strategies. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of knowledge there, Paul. <laughs> yeah. we try we try we try yeah but what about um, i noticed also when watching some of those videos interview you weren't wearing a jacket and i noticed you had an arm of is it your left arm or your right arm of tattoos no. um always like to ask on these and interested was there a is there a i couldn't obviously see what the um you know whether it's one one big piece of art or was it a combination of things over time anything significant that you'd like to in terms of meaning on um, any of the artistry? Yeah, very easy. Um, look, it, it, I didn't do it till recently, actually, probably about four years ago. Always wanted to do it and then never never did it. I think during COVID, kind of lots of people had different moments of, of clarity or, or look, what's the point of waiting around for things? So I ended up doing it. Your, sh- can I see your arm? Okay. <sighs> you have to. Okay, so from the top, I don't even see, I have an angel. Mm-hmm. Somewhere here, you might see a rose, and then on the inside, I have three doves, and then my wife's eye, and there's some lyrics around the outside of it, which are uh, from a band called James. I don't know if you remember them, but it says, Sometimes when I look deep in your eyes, I swear I can see your soul. And mm-hmm. well, one, I quite like the song, uh, but secondly, I, I quite like the meaning that it's not just what you see, it's the person inside that, that, that matters. And you know, to get a human connection is deeper than just skin deep. 
Then on the bottom of the arm, I have uh, Zeus Sela. Wow. And he has a, uh, somebody who's thrown lightning bolts down to call King Sisyphus. So in Greek mythology, there was a, a guy called Sisyphus who was a deceitful uh, liar, and he kept escaping Hades, um, getting out of hell. And ultimately, Zeus condemned him to hell, and he got sent down there for eternity. And his punishment every day was to push a boulder up a hill, only mm -hmm. for the boulder to roll down again every day. Okay. So what I liked about it, one is every day we start and we have to push something up a hill, metaphorically speaking, of course. Uh, actually, in rugby, sometimes it is pushing something up a hill. But, but kind of every day you start at zero, and you've got to push something up, and the next day you go again. A Saturday, on a Saturday, we start zero, zero, and we've got to earn the right to win a game again. We don't win because we won last week. Every day I've got an opportunity to be a better father, to be a better husband, to be a better friend, to be a better person, to be a better confidant, whatever it is that you choose to be. And I think the, the story of Sisyphus is something that reminds me that every day I have to, I have to continue to work at being better. And every day can be tough, but also... Because I've done well one day, the next day I've got to keep doing it again and again and again and again. And I like that kind of idea of relentlessness um, in life. And was that all in one sitting or two or three? Uh, no, I had to do it in a couple of days because yeah. one, right. one the size of my arm. And uh, so it took a little bit longer. And then secondly, yeah, because it was all over. Um, yeah. It was, I think it was like two and a half days, I think it took. It was all right. Like I, I, people, people have different feelings of tattoos and stuff not necessarily how they look and what the what the association is but rather the the pain element of it but i didn't find it i didn't find it too bad to be honest um it was more the feeling of your arm just being in a prone position and feeling quite tired and uh, you know the pain of that rather than the actual the pain of the needle it's a piece of artwork it's um and there's a lot of strength in the in the meaning and um i like it it's, it's great so switching back to rugby now now, what do you think, obviously, as a coach, makes a successful coach? I would say um, one of the best skills as a coach would be to listen and observe. Often people say you have one mouth and two ears for a reason, right? But but um, I kind of listening to people and observing people, I think, gives you, gives you lots of clues about people's well-being, about people's state of mind. And with that, then you're able to help them better. I think being uh, adaptable is is critical. Obviously, with each group of people that you work with is different, either culturally, either through countries and nationality, uh, through organizations. Um, you know, people have different values, di different behaviors, mm -hmm. and you have to try and adapt to that whilst also trying to bring you, your own strengths. Uh, being clear um, as much as possible, you know, making the message clear, believable, enjoyable, and confidence in that as well. You know, I think people can kind of feel when you're a little bit vague or you're um, chancing your arm a little bit. Being being resilient, being adaptable, um, being approachable uh, mm. for certain. Then probably the last couple of things I would say, there's obviously loads of bits and pieces, cool. but um, I'm not trying to mention knowledge here or things like that. I just yeah, try and take yeah. the and where we are. But I think... One of the skills of a coach is to try and put the learning into the player. Um, so I know what I know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, I don't know everything, of course. And and understanding that I don't know everything as well is important. You know, I'm I'm also growing. I'm also trying to get better, which growth mindset is is obviously critical. Is we need to find out what they know as much as possible. So checking for understanding and so on, but as much as possible, try and make them think of the solution or the process. I think is is one of the most important things to try and do. It seems easy or sounds easy, but it's actually the hardest thing. You know, often we get caught because everyone works hard and everything, and you do all the work because you think you're giving the best service to the players. But in reality, we're actually limiting their capacity for growth because we're just spoon feeding, spoon feeding, spoon feeding. Whereas much as possible, if we get them to think of the solution or them to think of the process and put the learning into them, then I think I think that's significantly more beneficial. Significantly more beneficial. The, the final thing probably which goes to listen and observe is to be empathetic. Is probably we all know we all have different stories. We have different moments the night before with your with your friends or your family or your partner. Um, you never know where people are at emotionally, and I think understanding that people will respond to different things and react to different triggers 
um, in, in, in all sorts of ways. So thinking of the person before the player is probably the, the, the most fundamental thing that, that as a coach in this profession in particular, we need to get right, you know, because um, if we win or lose on a Saturday, it's the same person. No one, right? No one tries to play badly. No one tries to make a mistake. No one tries to, you know, screw up a presentation. No one tries to miss a tackle, slice a kick, give a forward pass. But it happens. It mm. happens. And understanding that the intent was never there to play poor. The intent is always to play well. And afterwards, if we can thank them for their effort and they tried their best, then, then I can live with that. I like that. You've described, obviously, you lived it through the rugby context, but again, it fits into everything in life and to pull out those those sort of nuggets and um, put that in a in a piece of writing because it's um it's just it's it, it's very very important and I think one thing I thought in the business world where you have coaches versus consultants the coach is there to help guide and you know help the is in your case the player to come up with the own, their own realizations and your rather than the consultant who's there to tell this is what you're doing but I guess there is a balance certainly in rugby because you need to um, essentially be both don't you because there are times I assume with tactics or your gameplays and um, something I was going to say which I'm, I'm going to bring this in now because it made me chuckle are you a up and out kind of kind of guy or are you a in <laughs> what's it an up and in type of guy yeah, <laughs> so yeah. And I'll just explain for the, um, any listeners who, um, and this was new to me, and this was actually garnered from a presentation I reviewed that you uh, you, you shared. Uh, I'm not quite sure the circumstance. I wasn't looking into that. I was more interested in the in the knowledge. But the I was looking at different things like uh, are you the choke focus, uh, uh, and then um, up and out. What's it? Cohesive, passive, containing low risk versus opposite, which is sort of more confrontational, aggressive, pressuring, high risk. Yep. So is that classed as a strategy or a tactic? A uh, style of play or principle right. of play, I would say. So we right. obviously at some stage the the inception of of style of play can either be completely coach led or can be co created. So right. uh, I think particularly with 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 different elements of coaching in in a rugby sense, coaching as a as a pedagogy mm. or way of operating is different to the actual information. So. With defence particularly, it's probably something that can be a little bit more coach-led because it's less, there's less to think about, there's less, um, there's less room for creativity. In attack, it's more creative. So if I was to give you an example, if I coach attack, I speak softer, I speak uh, more openly, uh, I have my arms back, I use different language, I use... Uh, more more doing words, action words, adverbs, I have more descriptions, I have more adjectives. I try and try and flower it up a little bit to try and get people's brains thinking in a way of creativity and mm -hmm. excitement and so on. If I'm talking defense, I'm I'm maybe more into I'm more strong to a point. I may curse. I may I may do something, but I, I want to be more deliberate. I my, my body language is more powerful. Um, and I try and adopt the persona of the thing I'm trying to use. And allied to that, we layer in language that fits the style of play that we want in those different areas so for me i'm an up and in guy but <laughs> it's uh it's kind of obviously it, it's it's everything as much as possible if we can co-create then then i think you you always have a better chance of success in the long run right that makes sense you spend more time uh focus on developing the the person should i say versus the the tactics or the, the the style of play, or is it a combination? How would you or do that with a, a a new player? Again, having never played rugby, but I imagine in the workplace when you you start with a new team, for example, and you've got all these different individuals, and as much as we have a common goal, every individual is different as a person, and therefore, when you're coaching or managing or you know, whatever your hat is. Um, when you're responsible for working with a team, you have to be able to, uh, uh, or I was always taught, should I say, that to be the most effective, you've got to learn how each individual ticks because yeah. we are all different. Uh, years ago, I, I had to fill in this reviews and the purpose was so I could help better understand myself. I could, but also my manager could understand me. So sure. he could help drive, develop, motivate me. 
And it was then that I was opened up wow, how we were all different because we compared it within our team. Yeah. And as much as we were kind of the same, we were what what was motivating to one was very different to someone else. And how do you even manage that in a rugby setting? Because I, I assume it would be the same. Or Of course, of course. Look, I mean, I think, I think you know, insights, hogers, all these kind of things that, that try and um, understand people, you know, whether or not they're accurate or not, people can resonate with certain aspects of the feedback. Yeah. Okay. And I think fundamentally what we're talking about is a, 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 an awareness. Mm. Awareness itself, self-awareness is probably the hardest thing that people get to grasp with. If it happens early in your life, then you're probably on a on a on a faster path to to internal happiness than those that still wrestle with themselves and understand exactly who mm. you are and, and and what you like and and also being comfortable with that. Like everyone's personality is different. Some are more direct, some are more confrontational, some are more um driven, more more red, if you like, and, and they have a certain way, and then you have your yellows and greens and people are exactly. Yeah. different but it's okay it, it, it's absolutely okay and, and i think when people try and bend too much to a way that's not authentic to them and it makes them uncomfortable it makes them uncomfortable how they act and how they interact with people and then you're not getting the best out of that person so understanding who people are goal and and, and give incentives and and conversations around how you know how we can get the best out of them and also understanding when you are at your best is this, when you are at your worst is this. And again, helping mm. people be self-aware is is one of the you know critical arts of, of coaching, really. Like they, like you said, the tactics and the knowledge and stuff. I've I've played rugby since I was eight years old. Um, obviously I'm only 25 now, so it's not that long, but I've kind of um probably been <laughs> doing rugby like 30 years now, 30, yeah, 40, 40 years now. Sorry, I'm 47, so 40 years. I kind of understand rugby, okay? Like, I'm, I might not be the most knowledgeable. I might not be the best coach. I might not be um, understand everything about the game. But I do have certain qualities, and I do have a um, a mindset to, to grow and get better and understand more and improve. But actually, the rugby bit is the easiest bit, really. The, you know, the actual what we do is the easiest. The harder thing, and and I, and I, I, I doff my cap to Simon Sinek, Kind of the why is always the most important thing. Why we do it? Why we want to be connected to this group? Why we? Why is it important for me to do this? Why is it important for that player to do that? And trying to get the players to understand uh, collectively and individually that the why is more important than the than the what, and then together we work out the how. And and I think kind of over the years of coaching, I kind of stay as close as I can to that. Absolutely. Gosh, there's so many so many pieces of the puzzle to um, make it all come together. Do you think that mindset or physical is the most important? Yeah, as you rightly said, look, there is a physical need in rugby, uh, a physical capacity. Like not everyone, you know, it's a game for all shapes and sizes, it's a game for all, that's what we, we like to say. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily always been that way, but I, I think that we do try and we do try and live to a model that is, it's a game for all, uh, all inclusive, et cetera. And it's, it's something like a lot of sports and a lot of uh, different facets of life are trying to be more all inclusive. And it's, uh, it's something that hopefully society in a general direction goes that way. Okay. So physically there's a need mindset wise is definitely the, the thing, right? Because actually, again, it's the easiest thing to coach tactics. It's the easiest thing to coach technical um, in rugby, I, I always go there's like five things. Okay, there's there's tactical, which is the style of play we're going to do. There's technical, like how you can how you can elicit those tactics, how you can produce those tactics. So a technique of tackling, jumping, passing, and so on. There's uh, physical, which we just spoke about. So that could be in the gym, it could be contact preparation, it could be speed, velocity, etc. Then you've got emotional. So how we how are we getting people uh, aroused for something, and then the final one's mental. And actually, the, the the first four are the easiest things to coach because tactical, technical, like we said, everyone kind of knows they've all played rugby for a long period of time. Physical, well, I'm operating in a professional sphere, so people are making sacrifices, are doing what's required generally, not, not all the time, but generally. Emotional, well, there's an emotional arousal all the time because it's combat, so it's easier and you can get people emotionally spiked. But the mental aspect of getting um, a response after win, after loss, 
getting uh, responses during a week, you know, individually and as a coach, given projecting onto people, is how you pick yourself up, how you how you make decisions in your life that's gonna that's gonna help you have a better career, how you struggle with uh, a, a contract expiring and not having another job, how you how you deal with the end of a ten year career as a professional rugby player coming to an end, and it's such a not saying uncharted, but it's such a underused aspect of coaching. And as much as we try, I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, I understand things around people and I think I'm a good observer of people, but fundamentally I can only help them to a certain level. And I think as much as possible within coaching, we need to create a sphere or, or, or space where people can explore um, the, the mindset better than than I can provide or as general rugby coaches can provide. And um, something I observed, the conversation I actually had with a colleague, was it last week? It was actually pertaining to football, soccer. It's something that... It's not soccer, it's football. We're not in America, it's football. (laughs) (laughs) I like to to include all audiences. Okay, no, you can't do it, you can't do it, but it's it's football. It's always been... um, yeah, for yeah. me, it's been football, but having to um, integrate with others in order for speed of clarity, sometimes you have to. I had to, when you're living in a place, you have to adapt. Let me walk downstairs and find That's all right. Absolutely. I'm going down into... That's a nice space, isn't it? It's unreal, yeah. Like it's, um, we, wow. We, it's, um, the actual setup's really good. They, they give us... Um, really good. Okay, so what were we on? Uh, we were just you were talking about football, and then we'd. Oh yeah. yes, S- football, and um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, in my time, I have, um, I actually have played um, football. I wasn't allowed to play rugby when I was younger. Yeah. Only girl in my class, so for four years, so um, I had to play all the different sports with um, the guys. When I watch, you know, games being played, or immediately you know there's all these transfers and you haven't got this perfect result immediately and all the fans are going you bleep 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 and I'm sat there in front of my television going really and I then happened to see this clip um where James Haskell spoke about the commentary on booing in general for all sports fans about emotion escapism real life tribalism passion carnage that's that's the sports fan now I absolutely agree with those a sort of description but to me if we were sat in the room and someone walks in okay and they go julia you bleep bleep yeah. ww whatever and then you get a hundred people do that and then you get a million people doing that how would you feel i i break it down to that level yeah and i don't think to me i think well that's not really getting behind your team and you have to be aware just like in business you know if you get a new ceo that's going to take so many months for things to fall into play. I mean, it's just kind of, to me, life. But I've been told, with well, Julie, it doesn't work like that. Um, but I, I, and I believe also, if you're looking at things from a, I call it energetics point of view, um, if you've got 10 million people going, well, you're not going to, already thinking you're not going to win or you're already, that isn't supporting that team. But I then get the argument where they go, well, you're paid that amount or, what do you think? Yeah, look, I, I think I think the one thing um, with with crowds. So I, I I think you're very right. Look, negative energy breeds negative energy, right? And what Hask is, uh, what, what James is kind of saying, obviously, as a player, and mm-hmm. you can imagine he's played, I think, seventy three times maybe for England. Okay, so he's played in front of eighty thousand people, ninety thousand on a regular basis over a ten year career. Um, the feeling you have when your own fans are booing you is 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 not saying insulting, but it's 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 disturbing because these are the people that meant to support you. Now, the rationale of the fan is mm-hmm. I paid my money, it's my choice, I'm not happy with the, what I'm seeing, therefore I'm expressing my dissatisfaction. What Hask is also saying is sometimes, like we said before, people aren't trying to make mistakes and play badly or something, but sometimes the other team are just playing better. Like no one's coming to your workplace, you know, the, mm. the fans to your workplace and booing you when you when you get a phone call wrong or mm. you uh, have a poor conversation with a colleague or uh, when you miss a pitch or you um, d- don't close a deal, you know? Yeah. And it's, 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 it doesn't help you. Like we know that doesn't help you. 
Um, but it's just a way, and I, I, I don't know the way around it. You do see some fans in some places that have different expectation of performance um, and, and what the result could be. Um, in England, with the rugby team, the expectation is very high. At professional club level, it can be very high. But it's definitely counter counterintuitive for one and definitely counterproductive. Because mm. some people would say whether this is, um, I'm not, I can't quantify all this, but some people believe in something called collective consciousness. And they've gone and done different studies where people have gone together and say channeled a particular thought order and to yeah. seen an impact. Um, and that's only being aware of things like that. I thought, gosh, well, how if that applied to also you know, sports. But to me, as a whole, I believe that when people get behind you, it's going to be more effective than... Um... Of course, look, you, there could be something happening at the club that's out of the coach's control or out of the player's control. COVID, mm. financial constraint, people taking pay cuts. The impact on that and the, that local community of people, people outside don't necessarily see that or the conversations or someone's gone through some mm. personal trauma. And it's very hard for people to judge that you know, at least the one thing, the one thing I always think, at least, at least it happens publicly there. That is one thing, okay? Yeah. And go to go, okay, they express their dissatisfaction or satisfaction. What I, what I do think is more cowardly, of course, is the, you know, we call it the keyboard warrior, I guess, but, but people that make comments on social media and stuff and they don't understand really, well, maybe they do, maybe they do. They understand it's, as a way of them to express things, but but the actual damage they do to people is significant, right? It's significant, and and I think I think having an awareness of that, like there's a lot to be said about mm. the way techno technological advancements we've had over the last 15, 20 years, but also it's also kind of nice, like 20, 30 years ago, you know, it's also kind of nice without all that kind of scrutiny, and and we know, I now know seeing kids, and as a father now as well, I I, I worry about my kids in 10 years' time and the the need for likes and satisfaction and instant likes and stuff so big. Yeah. I'm not a fan of those who, um, you know, because most people wouldn't have the balls to do it in, 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 in person. And, um, and then I, and if you're looking at that, the golden rule, how you treat, how, you know, you treat others as you'd like to be treated. And I don't think anyone wants to be told X, 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 unless of course I can understand someone's gone and done something pretty we sort of wrap up any sort of top tips on fostering a more um empowered culture or uh like with anything you know culture whether it's a company a family country a sports team um it makes a it, it it all it has an impact doesn't it yeah. um yeah i'm gonna give you two kind of things on this i would say the, the successful cultures or cultures i think it is it, it's a it's organic for, for one mm. so I think it's the best ones are always evolving and they're always involving. So the the more people are in that in the involved in the in the makeup and all the rest of it, even though some people might police it yeah. uh, in a in a in a kind of leadership sense, everyone drives it, you know, and, and everyone has a part to play in it and fostering mm -hmm. it and safeguarding it and, and being custodians of it. Second to that, I think you have to be consistent consistent and insistent on certain behaviors and standards because whilst we mentioned before everybody's different and we all have a way that we like mm -hmm. now it's great that you and we want to respect each other's differences but you can't have your own way of living your life that could be um disruptive to others we have to you know there's always a balance to everything but i think as long as we have certain things that we we say look this is this is the boundary then we stay consistent insistent mm -hmm. with those values and behaviors and then allow everything else to try and develop. And, and as much again before that, the more people are involved in the creation of those values, um, at the very least, the creation of the behaviors, then then I think you find something that's that's going to be more positive. Um, of course, everyone has to draw their own connection to those values and behaviors. And that's again coaching, that's challenges, that's 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 what we spoke about. But but I think for for the most part, the the, the more that people can be involved in that process and understand their belonging and their why, um, then the better it will be. I like that. So finally sort of wrapping up, I, I thought about well, what's my most memorable rugby moment, apart from um, uh, a great game once in, uh, watching in Twickenham. But I can never forget, for me personally, I haven't watched obviously rugby consistently throughout the years, but is the 2003 Johnny Wilkinson kick for Australia. And I, 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 already, I already was 
visualizing and saying we've got to do this and then it happened so that made it even more exciting for me (laughs) and I was just just thinking about it and I actually played it back just before we spoke and it still made me very happy um (laughs) what about you Paul what's your do you have a moment um either watching could be playing or it's all with one of the teams you work with where it was like your I don't know feel good um um victory or experience any anything that springs to mind look I, I think over the years I've had lots of good experiences of play like I said I, I've played almost every level with England I've played for three big pr- uh, premiership clubs uh, I've coached you know some significant teams we've won titles won trophies won grand slams won big test matches um all of that and I could probably easily say one or two things but I generally believe this that my best coaching moment my best experience is yet to come so I'd rather I'd rather look forward to the next opportunity to grow, the next opportunity to be successful, the next opportunity to create a memory mm-hmm. than the ones I've already had. Um, in time, obviously, it's nice to to look back on those things, but but I kind of want to live for the here now and the next one, than rather look back and give myself too many pats on the back for things that we've done and stuff. So, yeah, my 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 answer would be that the best coaching moment or the best experience I've in rugby is the one that's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Watch this space. Fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Fitting around the family and your, your work commitments. Much appreciated. Take care. Be gold. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thanks for having me.